Greetings and salutations, young true believers. So today I want to talk to you about uh, two other forms of reasoning that combine elements of deduction and, and induction. And the first one is called balance of considerations reasoning. Uh, it's also known uh, more formally as abduction. So not abduction like I grab you off the street, right? But, you know, it's spelled the same. Um, and as I said, this they combine, this, this style of reasoning combines elements of induction and deduction. So uh, an example will help suss this out. So this is from the text. Should assault weapons be banned? On the one hand, banning assault weapons would violate the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. But on the other hand, when uh, firearms were outlawed in Australia, the number of accidental gun deaths fell dramatically. That would probably happen here, too. It's a tough call. So the first consideration mentioned in this passage, passage, that banning assault weapons would violate the Second Amendment and therefore should not be done, that's deductive, right? The second consideration, that banning assault weapons would reduce the number of accidental gun deaths, is an inductive argument. There's a probably element there. It probably would, right? So remember, inductive arguments, they are assessed according to relative strength and relative weakness, right? And deductive arguments are assessed according to the validity and soundness, right? Now, I told you there was one other style of reasoning that we should talk about, and this is what's known as inference to the best explanation. So, what is an inference to the best explanation? It's a statement that asserts or implies cause and effect, right? So, uh, here's an example. There is water on the floor. The most likely cause of the water is a leaking toilet. Therefore, the toilet is leaking. Right. So, as we see, an inference to the best explanation. Right. In an inference to the best explanation argument, the cause and effect claim is not the conclusion; it's a premise. This kind of argument, in effect, concludes that something is the case <clears throat> because it is the best and the most likely or most probable explanation of something else that we are interested in. So. Uh, now that we've talked about that, uh, a lot of students want to know, well, hey, how can I tell the difference between a deductive and an inductive argument, right? So I'm going to read you two statements, uh, and then I'm going to tell you which one is deductive, which one is inductive. But before we get to that point, after I read them, see if you can figure it out for yourself. So the first one, uh, it reads thusly, Juan lives on the equator, therefore Juan lives midway between the North and South Poles. The second argument is Juan lives on the equator, therefore Juan lives in a hot and humid climate. All right, now, if you, you've ever looked at a globe, right, you know that there's an imaginary line that people have drawn that, that divides the Earth into two equal hemispheres, northern and southern, right? That line's the equator. If you're standing on the equator, you are standing exactly midway between the North and South Poles. And this is an example of something called a tautology. A tautology, gang, is a trivially true argument, right? Uh, that is to say, it's definitional. A bachelor is an unmarried man, an unmarried man is a bachelor, right? So this one, the Juan lives on the equator, therefore he lives midway between the North and South Poles, that's deductive. Now the second argument, Juan lives on the equator, therefore Juan lives in a hot and humid environment, that is inductive. Now, the equator, as we know, divides the world into two equal hemispheres, but just uh, about a quarter of the way up from the equator and a quarter of the way down from the equator, you'll see two lines on any given map or globe, and uh, they're labeled the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. So this demarcates where the planet receives the most direct sunlight, right? And when you have a lot of sunlight, you have a lot of plant growth. When you have a lot of plant growth, you retain a lot of water. Plants retain water and release it in the atmosphere. That causes humidity, right? So this area between the tropics is known as the tropical zone, hence the name tropical, right? And uh, this raises the overall probability that Juan lives in a hot and humid environment. So this would be a strong inductive argument. All right, so <clears throat> pardon me, one last thing that we need to know about uh, or from this chapter and this comes to us from the great Greek philosopher 
Aristotle. And that is his three main methods of persuasion, or what he considers to be the three most effective methods of persuasion. All right. So the first method of persuasion is called ethos. And ethos is an attempt to persuade someone via an appeal to your reputation, credentials, or accomplishments, right? So you're going to see a lot of ethos in an, any given election year, right? You should vote for me because I did X or I attended Y school, right? Um, I have such and such reputation in the public, etc. That's, again, an appeal to one's reputations, achievements, or credentials. Now, the second form of, argue, of, of persuasion, according to Aristotle, is what's known as pathos. And pathos is an attempt to persuade via emotional considerations, right? So when you see an advertisement, say, for the ASPCA, and they show a dog chained up outside, and it's cold and the dog shivering, right? That is, that's an example of pathos. It's, it's, again, just an attempt to, to get you to accept the position by appealing to your emotions. And human beings have a very strong emotional side. The last form of persuasion, according to Aristotle, is what's known as logos. And logos is an attempt to persuade by appeal to rational considerations, right? So um, if you tell someone uh, if you need gas, then there, you should go by, you should swing by the gas station that's two blocks down the street. Uh, then you're trying to make them, you're trying to get them to appeal to rational considerations, even something as simple as that, right? Now, Aristotle noted, right, one of these forms of persuasion is much more effective than the other two, much more effective. And you probably guess by now that it's actually pathos, right? Uh, human beings are not wholly rational creatures. We saw that last week with consideration of the cognitive biases, but uh, we also have a strong emotional side. And that's not a bad thing because we could not, we could not be ethical without empathy and the emotions, and we could not produce great art without the emotions. But we want to be good critical thinkers as well, so we have to ask ourselves, and especially in election years when, when the stakes are high, am I being persuaded by the, the rationality and the reasonableness of this candidate's proposals, or am I being persuaded by rhetoric? Rhetoric is the, uh, the use of the emotional aspects of language, and we'll see more of that in weeks to come. All right, so I will see you next week. Uh, week three is on, uh, it covers uh, definitions, uh, vagueness, ambiguity, and generality.